About three years ago, around this exact time, I was working on a video called Portal 2 My Journey. It was a video all about Portal 2, how much I liked it and what the game looked like from the perspective of a person who knew next to nothing about Valve games. It was the first video essay I'd ever written and was supposed to be the first video to be released on my channel after a two year break. But due to a stupid mistake during the last few days of the editing process, I lost the entire video, leaving me with nothing but the assets I started with. And after working on this video for about three months without breaks, that simple mistake made me give up on the entire project. And so I never finished the video and deleted everything apart from the script and a few bits of narration. But I could never get it fully out of my mind. I had a burning need to finish that video and release it into the world at the back of my head at all times. And so after three whole years of waiting, I decided to take this task on again and can now say that I've played through the Portal games. And I mean, they're pretty good. <laughs> All dramaticness aside, I'm quite glad that the original video never saw the light of day since it would have been about as pleasant to watch as me taking care of a hungover friend. Portal is a franchise created by Valve in 2007 that spans across a whopping two games and is considered to be one of the greatest video game franchises of all time. I finally managed to muster up the courage to write about this franchise again after that previously mentioned incident and I'm ready to gush my average sized head off about it. I played Portal 1 for the first first time ever for this video and replayed Portal 2 for about the fifth time. Look, it's really good, okay? So I could give you more than just a half-assed ramble about how good a singular game is whilst completely ignoring its predecessor, now you'll get that same thing but I also mentioned the first game. But yeah, I want to get into the meat of the video already. I've done my beginning blabberings, the bodies have been buried, I've taken my medication, I did it in the wrong order. So let's get into the world of Portal, starting with the first game of the same name. Portal 1 was created by Valve and released on October 10th, 2007, telling the story of a human, a robot, and a gun. I fucking wish. In Portal 1, you play as Shell, a woman who has been suddenly woken up from an induced coma by a robot named GLaDOS, who tells you that you are a part of a testing program to test out the inner workings of a device called the Portal Gun. A Portal Gun can do the things you already know it can do. To get started on testing, you get let out of your relaxation chamber into the test chambers of this strange super sanitary high-tech laboratory facility place you seem to be trapped in, called Aperture Laboratories, and in Immediately you can see that the place is a bit too worn down to be a super sanitary high-tech laboratory facility place you seem to be trapped in. And it's not just because the game has 2007 graphics. The place has been in bad condition for a good few years. And I already love this atmosphere. The vibes of early Valve games in general are amazing, but unlike in games like Half-Life where the janky and grimy look of everything adds to the already rancid atmosphere the game is trying to go for, the signature Valve look adds a very subtle level of uncertainty to Portal, because it's supposed to be a very sterile, futuristic, and clean environment. But it's not, creating a constant feeling of slight unease. Also, there's no music during the main chunk of the game, which adds to this feeling. It's just the constant hum of the laboratory, with GLaDOS acting as your only means of interaction, and the only thing that makes this place feel at least a bit alive. The gameplay itself starts out in a simple way, with GLaDOS instructing you on the very basics of this world. How to put cubes on buttons, why you can and can't take with you through the test chambers, etc. And it stays relatively generic throughout. You gain access to a partially working portal gun, which is able to shoot one of the two types of portals, and continue on solving increasingly harder and harder puzzles as more layers get added onto them, like energy balls, the fully functional dual portal gun, and the constantly increasing sense of dread. You see, as the chambers go on, on top of the already unnerving atmosphere, you start getting hints of another more unfriendly side of GLaDOS. It all starts out by her blatantly lying to you, but still talking in a very professional way that devolves into slightly passive-aggressive death threats and soon enough into blatant insults aimed straight at you. 
most of these more unhinged moments are played for a haha, -ha, but when it's fairly clear that you are the only living creature in the slab stuck with this sarcastic version of my father's garage, it starts to feel a bit concerning. Oh god, yeah, speaking of, how have I not spoken about that yet? The writing in Portal is really good for a video game. You know, I think past me had a point, there is not much else to say past that statement, huh? GLaDOS is genuinely funny with her passive-aggressive remarks, and the subtle change in her demeanor from Haha, ha, I don't like humans to Perish is fun to experience. Being the only character with consistent dialogue, she's written really well. Just wanted to get that off my checklist. I knew I had to mention the dialogue and writing somewhere here, but I don't have much to actually say about it other than is good. Back to the actual gameplay now. More tests happen, more aspects of the portal gun are revealed, more comedic moments happen, and before you know it, you're getting very close to the end of the game. You've been promised a wonderful farewell and cake at the end of this journey. But just like with most things in life, the reality of the situation is a lot more disappointing. As you travel along the final puzzle of moving platforms, mixing in everything you've learned about the portal gun and various mechanics implemented throughout the game, it does feel like the culmination to everything and the end of your journey. But um, surprise, you're going to die, as GLaDOS reveals that the entire point of these tests was to test out the gun and then get rid of the human aspect of the test, so to say, to give room to fresher subjects that could possibly figure out something new about the gun. However, you manage to escape using the impeccable skill you've learned on this journey of pushing left click twice, leaving you alone for the first time in the game to explore the back end of Aperture. That sounds mildly inappropriate. Now, I knew this was gonna happen due to my general exposure to the internet before the year 2015, and from the various context clues, GLaDOS trying to kill you at the end of the game isn't a particularly big surprise. But the fact that about a third of the entire game is then spent freely roaming Aperture is a great twist and something that would have blown my mind had I not been spoiled on it years ago. You continue to explore the lab, getting debated a few times into believing you're through, only to end up even deeper inside Aperture. I need to stop phrasing it like this. Solve the conveniently puzzle-shaped rooms of the back of Aperture and find GLaDOS in the... Aluminum. And a final battle occurs. Throughout your exploration of Aperture's ass, you get introduced to rocket shooting turrets and personality cores, cores made to get GLaDOS to calm her ass down by basically introducing some voices in her life to confuse her into not being able to kill everything. By taking these cores out of her using the rocket turrets and portals and burning them up, it causes GLaDOS to implode and die for a reason still unclear to me. You pass out, only to find yourself and a supposedly dead GLaDOS outside, with you having gotten your freedom. Is what I would say if a robotic creature of some kind didn't pull us back down, goddammit. The final cutscene of the game shows the oh-so-promised cake scandal being blown out as the rest of the personality cores wake up inside Aperture, finally safe from GLaDOS. God, that was an adventure! One might even say that this was a trial. The original Portal, apart from the jank that comes with releasing a game before the first cell on Earth appeared, is, in my opinion, nearly flawless when it comes to the essentials of a video game. The gameplay is fun and varied, with a constantly increasing, perfectly balanced difficulty curve. There's a reason for everything you're doing, which is fairly rare in puzzle games, where the entire point is usually just to do puzzle. But in Portal, you constantly have a reason to move forward in real life and lore-wise. In real life, you might be interested in hearing what GLaDOS has to say next, and in game, you have no other choice because this dictator robot is practically holding you hostage, so you continue on doing the puzzles in hopes of of escaping. The visuals create an eerie mix of futuristic and worn down, making the atmosphere of the game phenomenal and somehow cozy despite the implications of everything. The super fun idea of the portal gun in general, the dialogue, the character of GLaDOS, the little bit of music used at important points, the subtly told lore, the other previously mentioned points, and a partridge in a pear tree, makes this game an absolute pleasure to play through. 
A part of the game I'd especially like to point out is the companion cube arc. I'd call it an arc with the amount of emotion it emanates. Throughout the game, you've been seeing and using these weighted cubes all around the place. But around the halfway point, you get introduced to the companion cube, a cube meant to serve as a companion to you on your journey. You're also told by GLaDOS that it has a conscience of its own. Having played through the entire game so far with nothing but this cold machine guiding you through the quiet ambient rooms, the idea of a cold cube guiding me through the quiet ambient rooms sounds a lot nicer. You have to use the cube in most parts of this large level to advance, and it really feels like you're doing teamwork with this object. This chamber is also one of the biggest in game, and the longer you spend with the cube, the bigger of a connection you make to it. Now, I am a person who frequently talks to inanimate objects around my house. I am a trust worthy person, I swear. So getting immediately attached to a cube came very naturally, and although I saw it coming the second I was introduced to it, it did hurt a bit to see the companion cube get eviscerated. So after this long arc of getting introduced to your only concept of compassion, it gets ripped away from you just like that in a second by GLaDOS forcing you to burn it. Obviously, this was set up very intentionally to get you as attached to the cube as possible only to take it away from you, but it still works because this entire section feels like an arc of its own. You get the cube, grow a connection to it, and start feeling like it's the only thing that respects you in this world, and then it gets taken away from you as a psychological trick from GLaDOS to fuck you up as much as possible. There's an entire story in this one chamber in the middle of an even bigger story that's also in the middle of an even bigger story. I'll get to that later. It feels like this entire chamber could be a tiny indie game on its own, but it's a part of an amazing whole that shows off the sadistic nature of GLaDOS, the game's ability to create humor, but also something that has at least, like, 4% emotional value, and it's just a perfect example of how to create a memorable moment in a video game. Also, this section is one of the best gameplay-wise, and overall it's just a perfect representation of what makes the original Portal great. You can focus on a singular point of the entirety and be enthralled with it, only to find yourself remembering, oh yeah, there's an entire game and universe around this tiny section as well, hell yeah! It's just... Great. For Jesus, I feel like I just wasted my entire positive energy reserves for the month. Let's talk about a few of the minimal issues of the game to balance this out. The only complaints I have with the game are really only down to its age or detrimental experimentation. The hitboxes of the portals led me to die a few times due to you having to be at the absolute center of the portal not to get stuck. The energy balls being able to fly around freely created a few situations where I had to wait a good while for the ball to reappear after accidentally letting it go somewhere where it shouldn't have, that jumping feels like early Valve game parkour aka bad, and the dialogue of the game sometimes happened before it should have. But other than that, I find nothing else wrong with this game. Well there is one thing, which is that this feels like a tutorial for something bigger. The puzzles in this game are very easy, and there were only a few I got stuck on for longer than a few minutes. I understand it's supposed to teach you the very basics of the portal gun, but it doesn't expand on these concepts enough for me to have it feel like a full-on proper game experience. The game took me about two hours to beat, and in those two hours a lot happened, don't get me wrong, but not enough to satisfy me. As an individual game, it is amazing, but thinking about it from the perspective of Portal as a whole, it is a decent game that serves as a fantastic tutorial for one of the best video games of all time. Also, I put in the script to talk about the secrets of the game, which are pretty cool, but I didn't know where to put this section, so you're getting it here at the end. So there's a few secrets in the game showing how there's someone who's been hiding inside Aperture's walls, writing messages everywhere for you to find. I'm not gonna explain the lore of these writings here, because it goes a bit beyond the actual games themselves. They're quite cool and hard to miss. That's all I have to say about them. In 2011, Valve released the sequel to Portal. 
cleverly named Portal 2, to the masses, which achieved critical acclaim from all around the world. And in 2018, I played this game for the first time, which is objectively the more important date here. Portal 2 opens up with you waking up in an extended relaxation center that you were most likely taken to at the end of Portal 1. You have no clue how long you've been out, how much has changed in the world around you, or how to do your taxes, but before any of these thoughts can be answered, a robot starts advising you on how to complete a mental and physical wellness exercise, aka a 20 second tutorial for movement before for going back to sleep. And then you wake up again to find the place looking like the average college dorm room. And suddenly, a knock is heard at the door. After opening the door, you get introduced to Wheatley, your supposed caretaker during the time you were sleeping. This ball is a funny fucker whose character I might get into in detail a bit later, but for now all you need to know is that he's the one that'll be leading you on during a good portion of the game. Kinda like GLaDOS, but less sarcastic and more Bristol. He tells you that it's been a while since you've been aware of life and some shit's gone down. Case in point. Everything is breaking down. Like me. And to get out of this mess and escape the currently breaking facility, you and Wheatley need a portal gun. So the quest for one of these guns and the proper tutorial begin. Good luck. Hello. The beginning plays out exactly like Portal 1, and whilst on my first few playthroughs I didn't obviously know this, I can now appreciate how they managed to basically make the exact same puzzles interesting again, by having the facility broke down and ruined, creating slight differences in the puzzles and a much different vibe to the original game. It contrasts really well to the original. The tutorial also has a new voice guiding you along, a generic robot voice meant to be used during emergency testings, which I only thought happened to people who suspect themselves to be pregnant. One thing similar to the first game is the general uneasiness during the first batch of tests. If it wasn't clear in the first game that Aperture has seen better days, they make it very clear in the second. The deadpan robot voice mixed in with the broken down environment creates a similar feeling of unease, but this time it's not because of GLaDOS, but rather because you don't know which one of the roofs is gonna cave in on you. But it is a puzzle game after all, so things never get full-blown unnerving. Speaking of which, the puzzles of this game are so much better than the first ones. Portal 2 gives the basics in a very similar way to Portal 1, but gets significantly harder during the later stages of the game, which I can respect since, again, the first game's puzzles do feel like tutorial levels more than actually difficult puzzles. The puzzles in Portal 2 require you to look at your environment a lot more due to the abandoned lab setting. All walls aren't portalable, port, port, portalable, portalable, port, portal capable, and you have to look further into levels for small details and pieces of portal capable surfaces. It is pretty obvious what can and can't be portaled on in this game, which does help, since in the first game there were a few moments where you couldn't distinguish why you can and can't put a portal on, so a clearer sign of why you can use is helpful. They're just more fun, more difficult, and more immersive. Good shit. Oi, oi! I'm up here! Oh, brilliant! You did find a portal gun! Okay, ready? One. Catch me, catch me! Ow! Ow. I am not dead! I'm not dead! <laughs> You get through the tutorial and Wheatley reveals that, unfortunately to escape the facility, you have to go through GLaDOS's room. The very room you killed her in. Funny antics ensue, which leads to Wheatley accidentally awakening GLaDOS again. Oh, it's you. And my god, how the fuck did you manage to get a bigger glow up in like a thousand years than I could ever dream of? GLaDOS looks a lot different in this game compared to the first one, but I for one welcome this change. She's much more expressive and, dare I say it, iconic in this one. I like it. And whilst we're on the topic of visuals in general, this game looks amazing considering there were only four years between this and the original game. Back to the point now, GLaDOS reawakens and is a tad bit pissed about the whole dying thing, throws Wheatley wherever, and you down the hole you used to kill her with, and so it's time to test with GLaDOS again. Just like old times.
GLaDOS is still such a fascinating character in this game. In the original Portal, she sounded sarcastic, yet calm. She ran the entire facility and had all the power, which led to her being able to say and do anything she wanted with the confidence of someone in full control. But in this game, the calm yet sarcastic demeanor comes from how pissed she is at you. You killed her and entered her previously thought to be impenetrable ego, but she keeps calm due to knowing this time she intends on making you suffer as much as possible by keeping you testing with her forever even after death. It's a slight change, but enough to make your time with her that much more tense. This combined with the constantly shifting chambers as GLaDOS tries to fix everything creates a good old feeling of you are screwed. And the dialogue during this section is fantastic as usual. The passive aggressiveness has basically just turned into aggressiveness with a calm attitude. Anyways, the game continues on, some ha-has happen, tests get solved with GLaDOS, and then... Chamber 16 happens. The puzzle of this room is fine by itself, nothing special. But as you look to your right whilst entering the chamber, a tiny bent with a turret inside can be seen. This was the first secret I ever discovered in a Portal game, and I don't really know why this is, but I think it's amazing. This type of secret isn't new, it's just mad scramblings and signs of another human having existed here before you like in the first game. But the inclusion of that song and the turrets singing together created one of the most unforgettable moments for me in Portal 2. They look so lonely, like they have a conscience. It's like looking at a particularly sad fish in an aquarium and feeling bad for it, except the fish has a gun this time. What I just said really serves no proper purpose in this video, I just wanted to say that this secret's cool. As you near the last test, GLaDOS keeps getting more unhinged, I keep getting more anxious, and Wheatley pops up occasionally to promise you he'll get you out. And despite understandably having every doubt about this working, he actually manages to get you out, and you escape with Wheatley from GLaDOS. So now that you've gone from 99% chance of dying to like a 98.95, you start exploring behind the scenes of Aperture just like the first game. But this time it's clear that there's a lot more of the facility to see. I feel like Wheatley really shines during this part specifically since now he's the only person guiding you, but with his general incompetence it's hard to fully trust him in any scenario. The atmosphere of this section is amazing as well. Abandoned factory settings are some of my favorite settings in video games ever, so Aperture whilst not completely empty and still functioning hits that spot pretty damn well with the machines constantly working on various things and the dark quietness only occurring occasionally interrupted by Oi! Did you know that it's impossible to commit tax fraud down here? That was my Wheatley impression, feel free to hire me, I am a voice actor on Casting Call Club. Anyway, now it would be a good time to come up with a plan to somehow not die, which Wheatley does, and it's actually very plausible. All you gotta do is shut down the neurotoxin, make all the turrets defective, and then change Wheatley's core in place of GLaDOS's, putting him in full charge of the whole facility. It'll be a difficult journey to do all these complicated tasks, considering you don't have a degree in engineering to my knowledge. However, I believe we can maybe do this with the power of friends. Boom bam, that wasn't that hard. And so you wind up back in a familiar situation with you and GLaDOS facing off against each other. However, this time the fight is more to your favor considering the very technical strategizing you did back then. After a very not intimidating or long fight of pressing a button, Wheatley and GLaDOS exchange cause. I'm still not sure how I feel about this considering the slight shows of ego and incompetence from Wheatley so far, but anything's better than GLaDOS, right? Right? <laughs> 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 
Uh, actually, why do we have to leave right now? Oh dear. So after GLaDOS insults Wheatley by basically just stating facts and saying that Wheatley was designed to be the dumbest thing imaginable to keep GLaDOS under control by constantly spewing dumb thoughts at her, Wheatley's already ego boosted ass gets so pissed off that he puts GLaDOS into a potato battery and accidentally punches you and GLaDOS down a seemingly never ending hole. After a very long fall, you find yourself not dead in a somehow even deeper section of Aperture as you see GLaDOS Potato being taken away by a bird. And it is dead silent. So far in the game, you've always had someone talking to you, whether it be the generic robot voice at the tutorial section, GLaDOS, or the embodiment of a British sitcom. But this time, there's nothing. Just noise. You don't know where you are, if there's anyone who'll be talking to you throughout this section, where GLaDOS was taken, and what Weedly could possibly be doing up above. Also, you thought Abandoned Aperture looked old and broken down. That place is the most pristine work environment in the world compared to this coal mine. It is dark, there's warning signs everywhere, and not a singular wall that's completely intact. You manage to come across a vault, leading to something potentially interesting, and after opening it, plus some more walking, one of the best parts of any video game ever, at least to me, begins. The disembodied voice you just heard is the voice of Cave Johnson, the founder of Aperture Science. For the next few chapters, he's the one guiding you along with pre-recorded messages that tell you the story of a broken man. So Cave Johnson founded Aperture Science when he was young, and is the reason the portal gun and the happenings of these games exist. You've stumbled across an area of the old Aperture facility, where the peak of humanity were called in to test some experimental products Aperture had created, such as the repulsion gel. Ooh, that makes you bounce. There were also some more unethical experiments, but seeing as this entire facility was built in an abandoned salt mine as far away from the public eye as possible, I don't think that was ever a concern to them. You actually get to interact with this repulsion gel during puzzles from this point onward, and this gel adds a whole other dimension to the puzzles, by adding more ways to interact with the world and combining the tricks you already knew with this new simple yet easily adaptable gel. It's super fun, and again, there's a reason you're doing this. You're traversing the same path the elite went through to learn more about this facility through the tapes whilst hoping you'll be able to make it to whatever presumably led the elite back to the surface. You continue to do puzzles with this gel, learning more about the practices of Old Aperture and Cave Johnson, who basically put science over everything in his life. And after a few puzzles with the repulsion gel, the tests seem to be over? But as you enter the supposed final room of the experiment, there seems to be no way to access the elevator shaft back to the surface. And that's when I realized this game is nowhere near over. You head back only to find there is another section to the facility you can get to, where you can activate the propulsion gel. Ooh, that makes you go fast, adding yet another layer to the puzzles. After activating the gels, Cave comes back in again with new pre-recorded messages, but this time things seem a bit more… bad. It appears the funds of Aperture have gone down significantly, since now instead of the elite of the world, Cave can only afford to bring in random homeless slash poor slash generally having a bad time people to test with the promise of $60. The reason for this financial plummet happened because of a company called Black 
Mesa! Oh my god! In case you somehow didn't know, this game and Half-Life are connected lore-wise. I have not played any Half-Life game yet, so I don't understand much from this connection, but all I do know is that Black Mesa is an even bigger company in this universe who essentially stole most concepts of Aperture from them and they can't do shit about it because Black Mesa rules all or something like that. But science must go on, and Cave keeps bringing people in to test the portal guns and gels despite being nearly bankrupt. In the building we find all this out in, we also manage to find GLaDOS Potato again. And despite all of the murdery intentions going on between the U2, to get rid of Wheatley, GLaDOS must be reconnected to the facility. And only you can bring her there, so a reluctant bond has been formed to take down Wheatley. And so you continue to test with GLaDOS now on your s front to hopefully escape the underground. Also, The testing area is just up ahead. The quicker you get through, the quicker you'll get your 60 bucks. Oh, God. Carolyn, are the compensation vouchers ready? Yes. yes, sir, Mr. Johnson. Boy, did I just... Who is that? What the hell is going on here? So Cave Johnson had an assistant slash partner called Carolyn in the past, and what I just showed you probably gave you an idea of why she may or may not be important to the story later on, but we'll get there soon enough. The second group of tests get finished, but lo and behold, you can't get to the surface elevator from here either, meaning it's time for even more gameplay, which I do not mind a singular bit. Now you're activating the third gel. The portal gel. Good name, I know. That serves as a gel that makes anything it touches portal material. And it's made from moon rocks, so you know it's good. The third batch of tests and recordings from Cave begin. And things have gotten even worse. So the company is almost completely bankrupt by now, to the point where testing for the employees of Aperture has been made mandatory, and due to the portal material being made of moon rocks that apparently have a high concentrated amount of killing inside them, Cave has fallen under a disease that seems to be killing him very fast. As this facility is getting cleaner and quote, better, the conditions from which the facility runs are now getting infinitely worse. And then, after getting through most of some of the hardest tests in the game, it's time to talk about lemons. When life gives you lemons, don't make lemonade. Yeah. Make life take the lemons back. Yeah. Get mad. Yeah. I don't want your damn lemons. What am I supposed to do with these? Yeah, take the one of the most iconic parts of Portal 2 is this speech from Cabe Johnson, where he lets loose and reveals his true thoughts and intentions when it comes to Aperture, refusing to have the facility die with him. He won't take the lemons life is giving him, science must go on no matter what. He's made his smart people start designing a way to import a conscience into a computer, more specifically, his conscience. Although he's not too sure he'll be alive to see it finish. So if he doesn't make it, he intends on getting Carolyn to run the place for him. And now it should all click. The reason GLaDOS has such human traits on top of being a deadly robot is because she has an actual person inside of her, Carolyn. This more human part of her is what has kept her testing for so long, and why she seems to be so intelligent compared to literally every other thing in these games. During the section where you're activating the third gel, GLaDOS lets her human side show for the first time to my knowledge, actually complimenting you as she realizes that she actually has a human conscious inside her. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention that Caroline has been subconscious to GLaDOS up until this point. And now with GLaDOS having realized this fact, Things are becoming very interesting, as now you've basically learned the true story of Aperture. But here's a quick recap just in case you didn't get it from my arguably flawed storytelling skills. So Aperture is founded by Cabe Johnson, and through the money they made from inventing the portal gun, they're initially able to test out all sorts of science with the elite of the world, though a lot of this was very unethical. But due to Black Mesa stealing their shit, the company starts going under. But Cave refuses to let science not happen and keeps testing with every person he can get his hands on, and once falling ill due to the moon rocks that create the portal material, he tries to get his conscience into a computer and tells everyone that if this doesn't happen in time, Carolyn will be the one whose conscience will be placed in a robot to run the place in his stead. This happens and Carolyn, now Glado, starts going haywire and kills everyone except for the test subject so she can keep testing forever. Until you come along and then the events of the actual games happen. I at 
adore this section of Portal 2. It reveals all of this info in such a cool way, having you go through essentially what the people who were a part of the company's history had to go through, just with less dying. There's nothing super important you have to read that could be easily missed. Everything necessary is given to you through the pre-recorded messages alone, and the few bits of text only give you more fun details that help clean up the story a little bit. The activation of the gels coinciding with the gradually devolving messages of Cave and the breaking down of Aperture we hear from them, the reveal of GLaDOS and Carolyn's true identities all culminating with the Lemon speech giving you a final lore dump that gives you everything you need, it is all amazing. This section of the game is absolute perfect. Perfection. With the other parts, there are a few boring moments and a few bugs here and there. But this section has nothing wrong with it. Everything is told and shown in such a natural way, where you don't even have to try to understand the lore. It's all given to you so clearly without actually shoving it in your face. I've played through this game so many times, yet this section is always the most fun to play through and every time I keep noticing slight foreshadowing or details in the messages and areas. It is an absolutely flawless section of a video game, and the best part of Portal 2. After the third gel has been dealt with, Cave has said his piece and all three gels have been used for a few final puzzles that incorporate them all, you get to get another vault similar to the beginning of this section of the game. And finally, you get to an elevator back to the lab. And so, the end is near. Wheatley is going down. And we learn that testing makes the robots horny. During your time down below, Wheatley has developed what GLaDOS calls an itch, which makes the robot in charge of the facility unable to live without the robot equivalent of a dopamine boost that comes from seeing someone or something solve a test. So essentially a kink. This has driven Wheatley a bit madder than before, and he's created turret cube hybrids meant to solve tests for him. But unfortunately, they're doing about as well as me currently, so much hasn't happened. You get to talking with Wheatley, and the master plan GLaDOS came up with to get rid of Wheatley was to hit him with a paradox. But honestly, giving a brain teaser to a hamster isn't gonna make much happen, is it? So this plan doesn't work, and now Wheatley takes over GLaDOS's role and forces you to do tests for him due to this kink. Itch. To it itch. Also, the facility is burning down even more than at the beginning of the game since Wheatley just doesn't understand how to run the whole place. You continue to do more tests Wheatley stole made for you, and it's revealed that much like with any addiction, Wheatley starts growing a resistance to the dopamine hit of seeing someone solve a test. This gives us some explanation as to why GLaDOS did what she did in the first game. She too had this itch in her to keep seeing people solve tests, and when the resistance to the dopamine hit kicked in, she would kill the subject and move on to a fresh one to keep the cycle of addiction going. It's actually a pretty clever way to explain a part of her murderous intent. And because Wheatley is now getting this resistance, he thinks getting you closer to him is going to help, thereby inadvertently getting you closer to your goal of replacing Wheatley with GLaDOS. All seems to be going well until we get to the part where he kills you. Well, this is the part where he kills us. Hello, this is the part where I kill you. Had a bit of a brainwave. No, 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 don't do that. Stand right here, stand. Where do you go? Come back, come back. For the third time now, you manage to escape from a killer robot in charge of Aperture. However, due to the significantly different circumstances of each escape, it never really gets old. However, this entire finale section does. It's because it brings it all back to basics, and whilst it does change things and add in some new stuff to fiddle with, it's just you doing basic tests again but with Wheatley instead of GLaDOS. This section is pretty important for teaching you about the itch and such, but I feel like it could have been the tiniest bit shorter. I've gone through so many tests now and feel like the best part of the game is behind me, so I just want to see how it all ends by now. I don't want to do extra puzzles. This is the only part of the game I have any negative comments about. About. It's like two or three chambers too long and escaping from Wheatley also having puzzles was just the tiniest bit too much for me. But this section is still great. During the escape from Wheatley to Wheatley, the only notable thing that happens is a moment where GLaDOS tells you that due to her programming as the facility caretaker, the hidden thoughts of Carolyn and the personality course from the first game, she's never had a calm and quiet moment to think because of the constant slew of various voices. But now she finally hears the human side of herself. 
Carolyn. And it scares her because she now understands the basic concept of how much of a prick she's been for the past few centuries. It's a great moment of realization right before the final fight. You're finally here, facing off against Wheatley. You've hatched a plan with GLaDOS where you have to attach core corrupting personality codes to Wheatley to be able to transfer GLaDOS back to her original body. It's a direct parallel to Portal 1 where the cores had to be taken away to escape. After using the three gels, portals, and Wheatley's own weapons against him, the personality cores get placed on Wheatley and the core transfer can start. All you gotta do is press that button. So Wheatley explodes shit and the facility starts breaking down completely. The roof of the facility opens to reveal the moon, which we now know is pure portal material. Wheatley starts throwing insults your way as if this were your fault, showing barely any change of character from the moment he got transferred. You get fed up with his shit and... Cool. Once you wake up again, Glado starts her final speech about friendship and Carolyn being incited. Carolyn, delete. Goodbye, Carolyn. Nope, that's the old GLaDOS we know and love. She berates you on how horrendous of a hassle you've been to keep in this facility, and because of how much of a nuisance you've been, most likely also due to Carolyn. I find it really hard to accept she would have actually deleted her. Finally, at the end of it all, you are let go and sent back up into the real world as the turrets sing a final song as a commemorative goodbye. You walk out onto the surface, and the game ends with GLaDOS throwing the companion cube up with you as she shuts the door on you forever. The actual final shot of the game is of Wheatley in space apologizing for everything. Which would be nice, however no one can hear him, therefore it didn't happen. Boo hoo, anyway the game's done now. I haven't played many Valve games in my life. But I have to think that this is one of, if not the best game they've ever made. Portal 2, much like the first game, is fundamentally flawless. The gameplay has a purpose and is constantly fun with a perfect difficulty curve and multiple additions to the base ideas. It expands on everything the first game did and fixes every problem there was before. It adds such a compelling yet simple story and though the game has only three characters you mainly interact with, they are all so complex and fun to listen to, it doesn't matter they're the only ones there. The music is much more impactful and many insignificant things like the light bridge and you jumping great distances get their own songs, adding to the vibes. Speaking of, the atmosphere of every single section is phenomenal and always fits the mood that the game is going for. The visuals for a 4 year gap between this and the first game look really good and the sound design is nothing to scoff at either. The Cave Johnson section is in my top 5 video game moments, sections, whatever you want to call them of all time, the rest of the game is only like 5% less amazing at most and overall I find it hard to complain about almost anything in the game. It subverts your expectations at just the right times to keep the game from getting boring and though I missed the hype train for this game by about a decade, I do not blame anyone for being obsessed with this thing when it initially came out, since 12 years later I'm still able to praise it to the high heavens without a singular doubt in my head. Portal 2 is a nearly perfect game, and one of my favorite games of all time. Goddamn, I love it. When I originally made this video, I apparently went into Portal 2 very cynically, thinking, one of the best games of the decade, as if. That was a direct line from the narration I still have for that video, by the way. I'm sorry you had to hear that. And my cynical mindset was turned pretty much immediately after starting up the game. And now with multiple playthroughs under my belt, which kept getting better and better, I can safely say that I love Portal as a franchise now. Portal 1 feels like a great predecessor slash tutorial for the masterpiece that 
Status Portal 2. Individually, they're both fantastic games, but together they make for a story of a company, a man who ran it and a robot plus person who learned to live again. It's a genuinely beautiful, funny, and fantastic experience that I wouldn't change almost at all. It's so... good! I'm starting to run out of ways to say that, but I mean it's fine since we're nearing the end of the video anyway. Even though the bitterness of never finishing that original video stayed with me all this time, I'm actually glad I didn't get to release that video since it would have been a lot worse than what I've managed to create here for you today. It lacked depth, understanding, and I didn't even play the first game you toss for it. And in general, it wouldn't have been something I was happy with for longer than like half a year. However, I went into this video wanting to make something younger me would have been more proud of than anything he'd made prior to that, so he, and in return I, could finally be satisfied and free of that nagging bitter feeling knowing that I was finally able to say the thing 10 million other people have said in the past. Portal 2 good game, I enjoyed. Thanks for watching.